Almost. Okay, it's tempting me to figure out how to get back to you. Welcome. So we're going to give people as they're walking in, welcome to the today's webinar. We are very excited about the topic. Uh, we are going into the meat of the topic of strategizing and developing strategies, developing the mindset that builds strategies. Uh, this is such an important topic uh, because I think we think strategies just come by. And particularly those in the business of teaching people believe that we will teach strategies and the students will just run with them. But there is some uh, behind the scenes operations and many of those who are familiar with uh, me and my webinar are very familiar how we like to take a deep dive and we have a special treat. Uh, uh, our guest tonight today is going to be a, a spectacular guest. So I'm letting people come in. So I want to start by kind of setting the stage. Um, the topic here is strategies matter, importing best practices from neuroscience of learning into post pandemic teaching. So uh, my hope and uh, uh, today that you all will learn a lot and my guest will help you enrich your lives. So uh, this is the thought that comes to mind when I think about strategies, this man is standing on the heap of <laughs> ladders and he doesn't have the wherewith to really prop the ladder and get to the other side. And this is a really a, an issue that we often face when a teacher or a, a therapist, a counselor walks in and is ready to teach. If the student is not ready or the student doesn't understand how to repurpose or purpose the strategies, <laughs> that this topic is really lost uh, on the student. So with that, let's talk about my wonderful collaborator today. We uh, have Dr. Lynn Meltzer. She is the director and president of uh, Research ILD from Boston. And she is going to um, uh, be talking about, uh, and, and she has been my mentor. She has been a gift uh, to me because I have learned so much from her work uh, in last 20 years. And uh, it's so wonderful. Lynn and I have collaborated uh, on many occasions, but it's a real treat to have her here. So welcome, Lynn. How are you today? Good, thank you for inviting me. It's a treat to be involved in this. <laughs> Fabulous. So my first question to you, Lynn, is how do we promote metacognitive awareness so that the students understand their strengths and weaknesses? Um, and I am going to hand over this remote to you, but until you, I figure that out, why don't you, you can Great. do it? Okay, see, see if you can uh, turn the slides back and forth. Okay, let's just see. Yeah, okay, so start. Um, okay. If you want to get started, go back to the slides. Sure. Let me go back. Yes. One more. <laughs> okay, so um, as always, Sushita asked some very, uh, some amazingly uh, deep questions. <laughs> and, and I always feel like, okay, we can just scratch the surface, but that's the purpose of a webinar is to give you sort of the first step and hopefully you'll decide to read further. And, in, uh, and um, a lot of the, information that I'm talking about, you'll find on our SMARTS website. This is the, um, the website address if you'd like to check it out. Um, we've developed an executive function curriculum from which goes spans the entire elementary and middle and high school and can be used for, for college students as well, the early grade, early stages. Um, and so if you need to, if you want to check out any more information, then please visit our website and take a look at our, our um, free lessons on the curriculum. So to give you a background, um, sorry, um, as always, I'd just like to scaffold what I'm talking about with some kind of, uh, now, now it won't go. <laughs> I can't go backwards now suddenly. Oh, okay, hold on a second. Let me get the... Um, do you want to go forward or backward? Uh, backwards, sorry, for that, that triangular slide, yeah. Okay, so very briefly, um, and I'm not going to go into detail here, but basically a, a large part of all of the work that, that um, I've been doing for, for the past 23 years is focused on sort of the um, a theoretical model that looks at the interconnections between metacognition, how kids think about their thinking, 
um, and how, how the, the importance of metacognitive awareness uh, in terms of interlinking with um, executive function strategies. It's the underpinning for executive function strategies. And it also connects with effort. Improve. When kids are metacognitive, their effort improves, their self-concept improves, they become more confident, their emotional regulation improves if you are outbursts. And most importantly, we build resilience and academic success. So Lynn, if I can interrupt real quick, um, for those who may not be familiar with metacognition, it's that awareness of awareness, right? Awareness that you have the thinking ability and capacity to reflect on your own thinking. Just wanted to set right. the stage for those. Okay. okay, thank you. Continue. Okay. So I think you're going to have to forward it, Sushita. For some reason, it's not doing it right now. So, um, so just to build on that, and then the next one. Yeah, it's thinking about your thinking, which is why we took the Rodan's thinker and developed it sort of as our, you know, created our own version of thing of that. It's thinking about the thinking and and, and um, learning about how you learn. And so that metacognitive awareness, as I said, is the underpinning for teaching executive function strategies, which is what our work is about. And the strategy, some of the pieces we're going to be talking about today is really the executive function strategy. So let's move on to the next one. Try your keyboard now. See if it works. Okay. Uh, click on, get the cursor on the screen. Sorry, guys, we are trying to get yeah. the best technology, but if not, then not I will. Sure why. It worked at the beginning. <laughs> oh, it did. Now suddenly jump. Okay. So the theoretical paradigm that I've framed out is, is one of a, a clogged funnel that when kids um, have do not have executive function strategies, so they can't set goals and prioritize and, and shift and think flexibly, then that funnel is clogged. And when that funnel is clogged, uh, it says, oh God, it says press, press escape or double, then the attention, the attention is affected. Um, the effort is reduced and emotional regulation is effect, impacted. So that leads to a buildup of anxiety and stress, which we're seeing big time right now with remote learning with kids and with adults and with teachers, all of us feel it. Um, so these strategies are important for all of us. So we want to promote self-understanding in every student using what I emphasize as a developmental model. You know, we're not going to use the exact same approach for a six-year-old as we are for a 16-year-old. Um, and uh, I don't have time to go into that today, but you can read more about that. And, and I know you as educators um, and psychologists and speech and language therapists sort of know these issues very well. So the questions that we're trying to frame are, how do I learn? Um, you're gonna to try to teach kids, how do I learn? How do I think? <laughs> this is behind, you can see, this is a processing speed issue that the computers have with us. <laughs> how do my strengths and weaknesses affect my learning and what strategies work best for me? When we, when we teach metacognitive awareness, that's what we're trying to emphasize. I don't know. <laughs> and so, is that still clear? For some reason it shrank on my screen. So we, um, next one. Yep. So Shishida, I'm just going to tell you to go ahead because. Oh yes, let's do that. Um, okay. So we so three th three approaches we use, and I'm going this very briefly. Know yourself in diagrams. The second one, if you could go to the next one, is metacog surveys. I'll show you two a few slides from that, and the third one is strategy reflection sheets and strategy shares, or strategy boards. Um, and of course, I've used this particular uh, visual for a reason. You want kids to have an accurate reflection of their own and perception of their own abilities and skills, not one that's either deflated or that's in, or that's inflated. And what I really like the like about this, uh, Lynn, is your med metacog surveys are so easy to administer, and and yet it gives you clear and clear picture on the student, which is really helpful. Well, thank you. Yes, that's why we've developed them with teachers of since 2004 when we first published the framework for them. And they're very, very easy. We've tried to make them very practical. They just take one period to, of time to, to administer. So the first one is Venn diagrams, just something you can easily create. You just do a Venn strengths and weaknesses and get kids to chart them. So this was a 16 year old charting my strengths are working hard and remembering and understanding and learning new strategies. And my challenges are paying attention and organizing my things and my time, taking notes and checking. Um, so moving on for the metacog, so, that, so we, use, we use those Venn diagrams and then we also use questionnaires from our metacog. And there are a number of questionnaires in this once again. Um, I'll look to you, 
uh, Sushita to move it on. So there's the motivation effort questionnaire and resilience question survey, which is for the students and the strat strategy use survey. And then there's a, a version of the MERS for teachers. It's the same question so that students and teachers have the same, we, we can compare their perceptions. So let me show you what I mean very briefly. So I have a quick question about this. Do you have any particular um, um, methodology which uh, one to use when? Well, our first guide like, like, is um, for each for teachers. Usually, the stratus is if you have no, if you have very very limited time, start with the stratus, which is kids' perceptions of what strategies they use. Um, right. So, and then that gives you sort of a window into how you can frame your teaching. So we ask kids to rate themselves on a scale from one to five and just here are a few examples from the kid. I just show you with the Venn diagram. Ben, I've traveled down, breaking down my homework into smaller manageable parts. He rates himself. He says he has trouble. If we can just move through these. When I'm learning something new, I connect to something I already know. He says he's okay. I have trouble organizing my thoughts before I write. Yeah, he has trouble. And on many days I forget to hand in my homework. Yes, he has trouble. Now let me just show you in the next slide the comparison between his perceptions and his teacher's perceptions. He feels he's a hard worker. The teacher says average. Doing well in school is important to me. It's very important to him. The teacher says no. I spend as much time as needed to get my work done. Absolutely. The teacher says he hardly works. I keep working even <laughs> when the work is difficult. He says I work really hard and the teacher says he's a slacker. <laughs> so Obviously, those are very different perceptions and we need to reach some realignment. And that's the purpose of our questionnaire system. And that's part of getting kids to reflect on their own thinking and learning and for teachers to recognize where, where kids are coming from or, or speech and language therapists or psychologists, all of you. Can we go on to the next one, well, please? Sure, and if I can uh, comment here, the, 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 num the numbers in red, the difference, higher the number, greater indication that they have metacognitive deficit, right? Exactly. <laughs> yes. and, and typically with students with executive dysfunction, their self-rating is much higher than the other's perception of their competence. Correct. And that's what you're trying to build, bridge, which is yes. fantastic. And a lot of studies, including many of our own a number of years ago, show that students' perceptions of their skills are often inflated. Um, and, and that's where sort of having these alignments helps both the students in terms of their metacognitive ways and teachers for in terms of the teachers or therapists in terms of their teaching and how they target their remediation. So just an example sort of on paper, how would you describe yourself as a student? I work hard, but sometimes I don't succeed in what I do. How do you think your teachers would describe you? Hard worker to understand concepts. How do you think your parents would describe you? Hard worker, but I can get distracted easily. I get distracted by anything that catches my eye and makes me um, pull away from my work. And what does the teacher say? This is about Ben. Ben works hard when a task is structured. However, he has no self-confidence. His concentration is erratic. His grades are poor. I'm not sure how to help him. <laughs> so we'll talk about the help sort of a little later. Let's keep going. And just another, and then, so I've talked about Venn diagrams. I've talked about the Metacog. This is the, the last one, this slide, is about strategy reflection sheets, getting kids to reflect on how they learn. Like, so before, so giving the, them these strategy reflection sheets before it, for after a test, an assignment, after homework, after any remediation. So this student, how do you, how did you write, how, think about how you write some strategies I used to prepare for this test. I used information I already knew to think up a basic outline to fill in the gaps. I used either my notes, the, the feed, the textbook or common sense. This is a kid with a amazing self awareness. So um, I'll end with that about the metacognitive awareness piece. Yeah, one thing I think neat before you get a chance to, um ask something of me, but what I really like the way you have structured and studied this is um, we are dealing with developing brains and by design their, their ability to take self distance and take a perspective on self is not that strong. And then we are asking them to take corrective measures to fix their mistakes, but that fixing mistakes won't happen unless it's fed with accurate information. So it's really neat what you shared. So thank you. Um, well, I know that you're going to build on this and you're going to expand on what we've just been saying. And so that's my question for you, Sushita. How do we build self-efficacy skills once students recognize their personal strengths and challenges and, of course, their learning environment and what it means? 
Yeah, so I also wanted to share with people this new tool uh, that I have designed, which is that EXQ, and it's for uh, middle school, high school, and college students to de develop these uh, skills for self-management. And the foundation of this, to me, is a self-efficacy self skills, uh, which is taking the metacognitive awareness, but and then tying that to uh, productive execution. Am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Do I know how well I'm doing? And when I do whatever I'm supposed to do, do I yield the results I desire? And so with, with that mind, so I have um, a website, you can explore that. Uh, and, and I really feel that it has profound implications for real life. So it's not just academic readiness, it's also life readiness. Our social uh, skills, relationships requires um, executive function. Our ability to take care of our health requires executive function. Our ability to actually maybe even manage our practice, like if you're a tennis player, requires executive function. So a little bit about EXQ, it's, it's a digital medical cognitive curriculum designed to directly build mastery of executive function through games, error analysis, and metacognitive reflection. And one of the things that is structurally built into this curriculum is that students are empowered with two sets of knowledge. One is who you are as a learner and thinker, and second is how do you become a self-devised strategic thinker. So not so much consumer of strategies that somebody else puts in front of you, but it's like a, a teach somebody how to fish versus actually uh, learn to fish yourself. So the way I conceptualize self-efficacy based on uh, the uh, literature, as well as my personal 20 years of experience that we need to target four fundamental areas. And one is that knowledge of self uh, and who is informing that? Uh, is it you coming up with knowledge of self or some people telling you who you are? Second is knowledge of expectations. And, and really the, the caveat there is the implicit expectations. I think we often are finding that the students are not fully aware that there is that hidden implicit uh, expectations that sometimes trump the explicit instructions. So something that maybe have been told in October uh, is still holds true in March. And uh, that we still don't talk in the class, still use your uh, quiet voice when you're in the library. But a lot of times kids forget over over time, they feel now that I complied with those expectations in October, I'm scot free. Uh, the third part is that knowledge of task execution. What is the pace of your execution? What is your executionary pace? What is your ex executionary accuracy? And what is that, that coming in your way as you're executing? And the last part is knowledge of self monitoring. Am I keeping tabs on me? as I perform. So I like to think about um, the, <laughs> this is a, a visual where imagine you're driving on a highway and there's a chopper that's following you. And the chopper is keeping an eye on the speed of that, that car or traffic ahead. So that aerial perspective on self is really that uh, very helpful tool uh, for self-monitoring. So how do we do that in EXQ, but also those who don't have EXQ or don't have uh, uh, want to use some paper pencil techniques, we can use this simple framework. So how to start with the accurate self uh, appraisal? And Lynn has already talked about uh, the three tools that she has developed and they are extremely helpful. I have developed my own tool, which is seven key executive function areas and three key meta uh, cognitive processes. So you can see that self-awareness is the king of it all. But to me, uh, these, um, you know, executive function has been defined in 32 way, different ways, 31 or 32 official definitions of executive processes. Uh, but to me, if there are subcomponents, there are lower order executive function uh, processes and higher order executive function processes. But to me, that applied to a student's academic ability is prospective memory, which is reminding yourself to remember to remember which is very integral part of task management, your uh, the organization and planning, which most people know, but self-directed problem solving. And the lastly, uh, mental flexibility having two parts to it, which is a social, affective mental flexibility and cognitive mental flexibility. And, and the, the foundation of this is having task knowledge, metacognitive reflection, and self-device strategic thinking. So the way we start the process in EXQ is student is asked um, a multiple questions in each domain of their, their functioning and as it applies to their learning in class, in the classroom, as well as outside the classroom. And so the, one of the things that I'm finding that the schools often have academic curriculum and all the 
soft skills are separate and those often get described as uh, behaviors or observations that the educators are making. And often those observations are about executive processes. So how about measuring and kind of having a baseline, not waiting for a official neuropsychological test to determine a profile of students uh, skills and abilities. And ba based on these uh, multiple questions, including a student's work habit and the games that they have to play in order to uh, offset. So let's say if you have a student who is boastful and doesn't have the best self-awareness, is claiming to have great skills, and the teacher knows that he doesn't, then the student actually is asked to play um, uh, executive function games that determine that if you say your focus is great, well, let's test it out. Well, it looks like you're not really showing the focus that you're claiming to have, and it has the capacity to adjust. So one nice thing about any uh, tool, a digital curriculum, that every student can experience this um, uh, assessment and we can create a profile of a class of 100 students at the same time which teacher manually cannot do. Um, so the learning how to learn profile is then eventually presented to back to the student with the profile of strengths and weaknesses. And as you can see for this particular student, focus is his weakest area and, and mental flexibility is relative strength. So, so now uh, talking about, uh, we need to then connect the uh, underlying invisible skill set to work habits. And so the student has to actually, um, so the first semester the student has to gauge and say, how am I doing on these work habits that the teacher evaluates? And then second semester, they have to say, what will my teacher say about these work habits about me? So it's really important that you already heard uh, Lynn talk about this, that the perspectives of to observer and the doer do not necessarily match if metacognition is not high caliber. So the gap in metacognitive uh, awareness needs to be captured by bridging the gap between the observer's observations and perceptions of the doer. And so that is all embedded in this uh, process. And finally, uh, and what is created is, is this profile of the student, then eventually there's really an emphasis on trying to, for self-efficacy, we must revisit glitches. So one of the, um, one of my pet peeves is that we are asking students to, uh, we are providing them feedback and then the feedback doesn't get reviewed often or in a deep way uh, because it requires time and it requires great insight. So what if the student doesn't have the best insight about himself or herself? And so that student's ability to reflect on the feedback. So the teacher may give a B and say, you need to really work on your, um, if this is an essay, you know, you're not uh, making a good closing argument or you haven't supported with good details. That's great, but abstract feedback. So how do we kind of get that? So often I have a process called glitch analysis that I use, which is having the students uh, uh, tally their glitches over time and then identify the underlying theme. Uh, so this is called categorical analysis process. So if you recognize a, or detect a theme in execution, you can connect the ideas. And so this is an example of a college student. So the college student says, I did not do well on the 3220 uh, 3200 uh, comparative politics because the first test was all multiple choice questions. So if this is what it, what's happened to me, then the student was asked to write in a narrative form, what is it that he actually did when he took the test and what was the process? So this is externalizing thinking, having the student to reflect in writing as, uh, as Lynn and I, and many of you know already that writing allows you to do something called self-distancing. So that ability to think about your thinking when you write becomes clear to you. And, and then finally, there is something called uh, understanding uh, the Im implicit or long-term consequences of your actions. So as you can see, explain the consequences of these glitches. So uh, this, the, the narrative is very long, so I don't have the whole narrative here, but the student has to talk that not only that this multiple choice question. So in my semester, I had only two tests and one paper and one final. But if one test I did poorly, it really is one fourth of my grade. So with the far reaching consequences, I now there's a danger that I may not be getting uh, a passing grade or I may be actually getting a very low grade, but I really want to be a major in uh, political science. And then this is going to affect my, uh, my college degree. So 
the next strategy I want to quickly talk about is this uh, strategy assessment. So I often ask students to talk about a strategy and write a, a, in a form of value or purpose of a strategy. What is the strategy supposed to do? So uh, this is a mock test and I'll talk about the mock test process as a strategy itself. But uh, she, uh, uh, th this, is, this student is saying that it is important to have um, have mock tests because it helps you study and remember important information that it could be uh, on an upcoming test uh, or something to remember for the test. So I'll walk you through this process of mock test, but the idea there is when the student writes the value proposition of a strategy, that really uh, kind of helps the educator or the teacher to understand if there is a complete ownership of that strategy or not. And second thing is to apply that strategy to multiple contexts. That will only happen if the strategy has been assessed in terms of its value. The next thing, um, and this is my last strategy for uh, this section is a worksheet of uh, connecting self to the larger context. When we talk about self-efficacy, it's really important to understand the larger cultural context. So, so let's say my son went to um, Westminster School and so they are all called wildcats. It's really important that the school has constantly talked about you are a wildcat. And as a wildcat, you don't do this. And as a wildcat, you don't do, you do this. Uh, we are Kamats. So at home, we talked about, we have with our children talked about this. You are a Kamat. You don't do this. And you're a Kamat. You do this. Now, what happens is once you embed a larger string that acts as a commitment device, it really helps the student to understand that they are not required to use strategies or strategic process just to do well or poorly, but it's their commitment because they belong to a larger culture of that school, a larger culture of that family. So um, that's how I would approach it. So my question to you now is, how do we teach students uh, to set manageable goals now that we know they need to work on their weaknesses? So, Sushi, are you going to move it forward? Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, so as I talk about goal setting, um, I, it's, a, it's a huge topic. <laughs> and uh, we, have a, we have a very uh, close time limit here. So I'm, I'm basically just really going to touch the surface very briefly. But this sort of expands on what Sushita was just talking about often relates to goals. Because before, in those situations where we're asking students to be self-reflective and to be thoughtful and to do error analyses with their with their work, they often need to, for themselves, set set goals. And there, and as we know, goal setting is very layered. It's we can talk about short-term goals, long-term goals, and I also often talk about immediate goals as well. Like, what do I need to do right now? What do I need to do for later today? What do I need to do for tomorrow or for next week? Which was the long-term. Um, and, and within those goals, we have sort of set goals for uh, academic work, for personal, for personal social interactions, for uh, you know daily life for the kids these days with remote learning. Those goals have sort of really um, changed uh, in terms of you know scheduling and all the challenges of remote learning. Um, so I'm gonna, but I'm gonna focus very briefly on just what we what we emphasize through our smarts. Um, program and these are a set of lessons um, that are that are part of goal setting um, or what we call can do goals so we teach students whether it's short term long term um, systematically to recognize that when they set goals these goals they have to ask themselves these questions this is a self-monitoring and the set the metacognitive awareness piece is my goal clear is it appropriate um, is it numerical? And I'll show you what I mean. Is it doable? And have I considered the obstacles? Because kids set these lofty goals, like, you know, a student who's failing right now, and then his goal for, to, he's failing in math, and his goal is within two weeks, I'm going to get a, you know, a B plus. Well, that's not a reasonable, that's not a doable goal. He has to look at the obstacles. So when you get kids to break it down, it's like, okay, let's have that goal. It needs to be more longer term and let's break it down. What are you going to be doing from day to day in terms of breaking down your math homework and not, not, going, not focusing on talking with friends or watching TV or going to a soccer game uh, if you have to um, fitting all of those other activities in. So let me show you in the next, we can have the next slide. So for example, this student said, 
my goal is to keep my papers organized. I want to do better in, in um, writing. So therefore, and in general in school. So I'm going to focus on the fact that I'm disorganized like Ben was. So how will I do this? By getting rid of papers weekly, turning my pile at home into a folder to keep separate from my sibling stuff and making sure my binders are neat weekly. So obviously this can be sort of broken down even further uh, through can do goals, but he got to this point by using the strategy. So let me show you another, um, how we, how we teach it through smarts. Um, so help make your goal doable by listing three steps needed to achieve it. Could we have the next? I want to read 25 books this year is a student's goal. I want to do better in my English. And if my goal is I want to read 25 books this year. So this could be a goal either for an elementary student at their level or a middle school student or even a high school student. All right, let's keep going. So what are the steps for reaching the goal? Can we move on? It's doable because there are three steps listed to help achievement. First of all, I had to get books to read from the library or the store. Secondly, I have to schedule my, and of course these days it'll be on my Kindle or on my <laughs> iPad as well. I'm gonna schedule, schedule time to read at least 20 minutes every day. And then I'm gonna create a book log to keep track of the books I've read. Um, and then I'm gonna read 25 books this year. So that's the question of whether it's doable, breaking it down into steps. So we, remember it's can do. So let's think about what are some obstacles that might get in the way of reaching your goal. Well, I want to read 25 books this year. What are the potential obstacles? Um, let's take a look. Get books to read from the library or store. All right, if we could have the next. This is, um, it's hard to find a book I want to read, so I get stuck. Well, I need to schedule time to read 25 minutes every day. What's the obstacle? I got busy with other work or more likely busy on the phone or with our social media and I couldn't read. The next one, create a book log to keep track. What's the obstacle? I keep forgetting to track the books I've read. Um, and so let's keep going. And so are you gonna read those 25 books? Well, you have to figure out a way of overcoming your obstacles. So I can't find a book to read. What's the way of overcoming it? Ask your teacher or friend for recommendation or a parent, of course. I got busy with other work. What's the obstacle? How are you gonna address that? Make up the time on another day. But put it into your schedule because that's the other issue is we focus on time management and teaching kids how to schedule their time and their day and their week very systematically. I forget to track the books I've read. Ask your parents to remind you to track your books or write the title of the book first and check it off when you're finished. So developing a system and thinking through this, that self-monitoring piece which and that self-efficacy piece that Sushita was talking about as well. Next. Um, so... So before I end and I ask Sushita a question, I just showed you, as I say, a very short, um, short um, overview of the can-do goal setting um, strategy. Um, and as I said, as I mentioned earlier, you can certainly um, sort of take a look at our website. If you become smart subscribers, then you actually will have the um, the um, the actual lesson plans. We have we have thirty lesson plans. Uh, PowerPoints and hundreds of student uh, worksheets and also training videos. So you can sort of get a sense of that. But most importantly, these are strat the goal setting and breaking it down this way you can do in your daily practice in whatever way you choose to do it. The importance is to structure it, to be explicit and to get kids to, to keep focusing on the fact that kids have to think about how they're thinking and learn how they're learning the whole metacognitive awareness piece. So I'd like to move on to ask Sushita a question which is how do we incorporate goal attainment scaling to connect immediate goals to future goals, short-term versus long-term? Okay. Yeah, so to build on what you said, um, the idea of immediate versus future goal, I'm gonna take a slightly different perspective, a layer, as you were mentioning earlier, that the future goal is serving the future self. So, and the immediate goal is serving the immediate self, the current self. And the gap between the current self and the future self, when it widens, then there is a disconnect. And that disconnect then cannot be compensated or motivated, or one cannot self-motivate if the gap is so in so large that the relationship that we must have with the future self is intangible. So it's a really important uh, concept from social psychology that I like to bring into my work to create a relationship with the future self, that I am not only a, a friend of my future self, but I'm a champion 
uh, of my future self. I'm championing for his success. So what needs to happen in order to do that is you need to match current expectations with level of skill readiness. So is, uh, is the expectation that you have of the future self uh, in sync with the skills that the child is, or the student is showing? Second is the essential self-reflection. Um, so if you are self-blind, your self-reflection often can be very mediocre and it can say, I think it went well. And I think I was so great. <laughs> so if you have those kinds of um, feedback processes, then it's less likely that you will be motivated to serve the future self. If you do not distinguish, and that there's an interesting study that I read many years ago that they, they asked people uh, what they would like to become in the future. And, and they had grand aspirations for themselves. And uh, they, they, had, they actually had no imagination rather to imagine how they would be in the future. But when they were asked, uh, and the time frame was 10 years, okay? In 10 years, how would you change? And they were asked to write and they couldn't describe themselves. They were, were very close to their current self. But then when they were asked, how different or same are you from your 10 years ago? And boy, people could write a narrative. And they said, oh, oh, I am not that person anymore. So I think there's a fundamental inability that we don't have the best ability to do time travel, to understand in what ways we can potentially change. And hence, we may not actually have the right motivation uh, embedded in our actions to serve the future self. The couple of other things is welcoming feedback. Uh, regarding uh, from mistakes or experiences of errors, and then taking uh, time to be mindful. And, and mindful is going back to this idea of, are you taking the right steps in the current moment to serve your immediate goal? But the immediate goal is a larger part, is a smaller part of the larger goal that exists uh, for me, that I have created for me. And then li lastly, imagining the need uh, of the future self. Uh, so is my future self um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, limping by the roadside or is my future self running a marathon? So that ca capacity. So I envision that we can have uh, do this in three steps. So one is discuss what the students want, uh, then discuss how the, uh, the future self needs uh, the support and commitment from the current self and what kind of uh, commitment are you willing to make for that future self? In a lot of work that I have done, uh, and, and in, in, including in EXQ, there's a component called Dear Future Me. So there is a, a writing letter to the future self or, or, or making a video uh, to address the need of the future self uh, and saying, hey, I'm doing all this for you because I want you to have a successful school year. This can be a really great commitment device. And finally, help students develop uh, that capacity to self-direct through internalized speech. This is one of the... Uh, um, one of the ways we manage our working memory, this is one of the ways we manage our executionary pace and commitment or task deviation. So having that internalized step, what am I going to do next? I, do I have everything I need? Oh, let me start doing this. This kind of mumbling to yourself is a important way to help yourself serve the immediate goal. So I'm going to walk you through some of the examples of this goal management process. So here is an example called, called scoping the academic landscape. So when I begin working with the students, I kind of have the students write their classes. Uh, how, how am I doing in this class? What strategies do I need to use? And do I have any questions for my teacher so that I can improve in my class? So in French, this kid is saying, I, I have okay teacher, I pay attention and my grade is 93%. So if I'm doing well, then I, I will, I need to, do I need strategies to do better or do I need strategies to continue to do well? So these are three strategies he has come up with. I sit in the front, I study before quizzes and tests and I do my homework. Now, uh, the question he has for the teacher is, can you explain the directions again, what's going to be on the test? So now this process can really help the student to understand the, where specifically a strategy needs to change. And I recommend that if you're an adult, you can do this in not subjects, but your aspects of life. I call that multifaceted goals. And uh, you can also have this category questions I need to ask my teacher. You can have questions I need to ask of someone who has more expertise in this. And, and so uh, th this is a good, good again, like creating a little landscape for yourself. The next thing is this goal uh, attainment scaling, 
which is kind of addressing that multifaceted goals by, by first establishing what my big picture for, uh, for me is. So I have academic goals, I have personal goals, I have social goals, and I have family goals. And I like to remind students that we don't operate in a void. That means when you do homework, and your homework cannot be reason for you to eat dinner with your family. Uh, or because you, you have set up, uh, uh, you promised your friend that you will walk with him uh, to the library and you, you cannot now say no because you're playing a video game with another friend. So uh, this idea that we are toggling between multiple goals and we have to prioritize them because it's serving different aspects of who we are as a future self. So how does this get scaled? How, do, how does a clinician or a teacher, as well as the student kind of keep track? So I like to create something called this goal attainment scaling, which is a well-researched idea, which is mapping the goals uh, from the, the, pick, the future self to current self and bridging the gap through steps. So uh, what um, can do goals that uh, um, you were talking about, Lynn, this is a breakdown of much at a larger construct of a landscape of goals. So if, if I want to, I am a ninth grader and this is September and I want to take AP history because if I take another non-AP history, I'm going to be utterly bored because I love history and I'm good at it, but I just don't have the strategies and organization because I take it for granted that I think I got it so I don't take notes and then I don't do well on tests. So I'm doing poorly, not because I don't like history or I don't get it, but I just don't have any systems that help me uh, do well. And unless and until I do well, I will not be offered the AP history class. So for starters, I need to be at this uh, bottom level here, learn to sustain attention, minimize distractibility, and then keep uh, keep a, a clear headed focus so that everything I'm understanding can really register and I don't have to go home and read again. So, so that understanding about how do I need to behave in the classroom and then how do I then manage information at a larger, so I need to use organization and, and planning tools, then how do I do uh, critical thinking that I need to understand what kind of questions. So if you have DBQs in AP history, that's gonna require me to compare multiple documents and do analy analysis and synthesis that requires me to actually have critical thinking skills. So maybe it looks like that when things get, uh, when I get into the thick of it, I don't explain my answers. So if I want to take AP history, <laughs> me having to correct myself is one reason because it will get me closer to my bigger picture goals. In, in EXQ, and by the way, I think somebody asked a question that uh, what is the relationship or are both EXQ and SMARTS uh, programs linked. So I would say uh, they are as linked as anybody who's interested in executive function. So we have two uh, very specific approaches to addressing um, executive function. I will speak uh, about EXQ. It's specifically designed for individual students to learn how to learn to think. And so it's directed directly towards the students. And I think um, you can speak about SMARTS, uh, but it is for the teacher to use with individual correct. students, correct? Yeah. Okay, and mine is entirely uh, uh, digital and it's, it's for a year long curriculum uh, delivered as lessons as if you take math, history, science, uh, or even um, if you're in gifted courses. So uh, as the student uh, gets his or her own profile, EXQ creates the goals for students and EXQ nudges the students to create goals for themselves. So the idea there is that again, personalizing the experience, but also keeping the experience dynamic. That means two students who have problems with focus will not have same personal goal. And so that capacity, of course, when you digitize something, the, it allows you to um, approach this in a much more comprehensive way. Um, this is my, my example. Finally, uh, once you have the student uh, to do the metacognitive assessment of self and create this, this understanding of who I am and what I need to achieve, then I, I, I recommend students to do engage in self-advocacy. And, and I ask the student, all the students I work with, ask them to write a letter of advocacy to their teacher. 
and and so this is the this is probably I recommend to do it at the beginning of the year. And even if you uh, if there are parents listening to this, I recommend you do this exercise with your children as well. Because why? Because it's really important to explain yourself to others. That exercise allows you to kind of concretize your own understanding of self, but it also gives an, a window. Uh, of opportunity for both the parties involved to discuss how to engage in, in talking about difficult topics. So for example, uh, this is uh, Cameron. He says, hello, my name is Cameron. I would like to inform you of some of my strengths and weaknesses in academics and out of school. I'm a very talented athlete. I'm, a good, I'm good at math. I also excel in history and science. Some weaknesses that I possess are, are writing and paying attention for long periods of time. I want to excel in school, but it can be hard for me because I have executive dysfunction. This is, of course, somebody I have worked with, so they're using a very technical word. <laughs> uh, this means that I am not very well organized. I would like you to know this about me because I want to inform you that I am trying hard, but my results do not always reflect the effort that I have put into the work. This is a really meaningful letter if the teacher receives it. One, it translates the student's desire and motivation, which if you know anything about students with executive dysfunction, they are not quite transparent in seeking help. But secondly, this can also gives an opportunity for teacher to list some more strengths that she notices and point out some more challenges that she feels are worth his attention and effort. Uh, this is another exam example. Um, this is a senior that I worked with. He wrote a letter to his teacher. He says, I'm a rising senior. And although I have attended uh, blah, blah, blah school for so many years, I thought it would be a good idea to remind you of my difficulties I have and what kind of help I, I will need this year. One of my biggest concerns for myself is the inability to meet deadlines. So creating smaller ones may be a good way to help uh, a way to keep me on track. Also, it takes me longer to finish tasks in general, whether at school or at home. I may need extra time or some assignments to make sure I do them well and uh, hand them in, uh, in com hand them completed. Despite of these difficulties, I am a good student and I'm willing to learn and take the steps to improve my methods to study so that I am not constantly overwhelmed. Looking forward to this year. So this is, again, as I was mentioning, um, a wonderful exercise in goal setting and, and using this, these letters as a communication uh, vehicle for, uh, for establishing a relationship between teacher and students. So I know we are very uh, close to our end. Maybe we can make this very quick, Lynn, but I have a question for you. How do we teach students to think uh, and problem solve flexibly? Um. So building on, so can we go to the next one? So building on uh, the issues that we've discussed, our focus of course is to get kids to not think they sort of be rigid in terms of their social and behavioral, um, so their social uh, thinking as well as their cognitive thinking, but to be flexible. So moving on, um, as I see it, cognitive flexibility is the core, is the most important executive function process. Can we go on to the next slide um, that we, that we um, need to focus on. It's the foundation of all of these processes. Self-reflection, the metacognitive awareness we're talking about is really often also, these are all interconnected. It's interlinked with this flexibility, being able to shift and toggle back and forth as Sushita mentioned earlier. So the issue is being able to stand, this is the theme I always use, um, standing at the top of the mountain, seeing the big picture, um, when you're at the bottom of the mountain, you don't even see the trees, you only see the leaves, you're in the depths of the details, and kids need to learn, and we as adults need to always remember that the only way we're going to keep our funnels unclogged is if we can sit, if we can easily go back and forth from the main ideas or the big themes or the big picture to the details and then back to, to, the, to the details, and this is relevant for everything we do, and particularly for the academic skills that kids have to master from the earliest grades right through to college. So, um, so the next, so a fun way of teaching cognitive flexibility, especially when you know many of you are speech and language therapists and you dealing with kids one-on-one -on -one is through jokes and riddles and puns and uh, focus on ambiguous language. And we start this at a very early age 
as you, those of you who are parents obviously um, can do this as well. And as we know, in the earliest grades, preschool into first grade, we kids, this is a natural, we always use Amelia Bedelia books. Um, we, uh, people have fun with them they, and kids, what, what, what we don't think about is that we really are teaching cognitive flexibility and linguistic flexibility. You know, Amelia Bedelia dressing the chicken. My favorite so, series, by the way, by far. far. <laughs> it's my favorite. <laughs> yeah, the literal versus the figurative meanings. But of course, when kids get into first grade, people decide, oh, that's no longer mature enough for our first graders who really need to be serious students. So we'll just forget all about, about that and we'll just focus on, you know, let them learn to read and let's teach them the phonics. And well, the reality is we can't forget that. We really have to be focused on that. And what we recommend, what I recommend always and what we recommend and sort of built into some of our smarts lessons and lesson plans is sort of how do you, how do you teach this? So I just want to show you a few examples uh, of things, I mean, you can get these from the internet, you can download these ideas, but these, um, you know, he bought a donkey because he thought he might get a kick out of it. So the literal and the, and the figurative meanings, and but getting kids to diagram. So the way in the earliest grades, you can get kids to just draw out the different meanings. Then you can get kids to discuss the different meanings. In the older grades, I always recommend start, start every, you know, every, once a week or twice a week, have two or five to five minutes with jokes that kids can share with each other. It can create because that allows you to be explicit and systematic about talking about the importance of flexibility and then showing kids or student, older students the relationship with their academic work. So students really need to learn to shift perspectives and to self-monitor flexibly when they read, when they write, when they solve math problems, when they interact socially. It's a core of all academic work, note-taking, um, st studying for tests. And right now with remote learning, it's certainly critical. Can we move on? So this is one of our strategies from SMART. If we, if we teach kids systematically, sort of all the components, we have the lesson plans. But basically, it's like the strategy that so many teachers use in the first grade is, okay, let's teach you a book report, who, what, when, where, why, how. But what they forget, what we often forget is that kids aren't, don't even remember what that, what that what those who, what, where, when, why, how refers to. So by creating this uh, a coherent star, we found it creates a visual for kids they put those different keywords in the in the edges of the star and then they frame out their main ideas this focuses kids on what is the main idea and then afterwards they support those with details so it's okay step back what's the book report about or can i can we go on to the next one I can show you at a middle school level this was a complicated science um, science project that students had to do to read about Mars and studying uh, and um, kids uh, uh, why at that stage there was a space race on and so it's the same thing who what when we why how the main characters were Russia and the United States what was the issue they were trying to find uh, you know to to get to get to Mars and to find out whether there was life and so on so get framing out the main ideas where kids often students often do not know where to start this is the starting point. This is standing at the top of the mountain and then teaching them how to support the details. And if, and if it's a middle high school, then you know that five paragraph essay can be evolved from that. Um, can we go on to the next one? Because I'm just spot checking a few things. We often ask kids to highlight and what do we have? What I call the yellow book effect, right? They just highlight everything. They don't go from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the mountain. So we need to teach them to shift flexibly from the main ideas, like what are the two main ideas? Use the, the if we could just have the next, uh, different colored highlighters, pink and yellow. So in important details are in pink and the main ideas are in yellow, just highlight two main, two or three main ideas, nothing more. You cannot highlight everything. And then what are the supporting details? So this is an activity that can take a while, of course, but you're getting kids to think, to think big and then to think small. Can we go on to the next one? I'm trying to go through this. Um, you know, briefly. And then um, we have our favorite, favorite, my favorite, favorite strategy that we have in SMARTS is called triple note talk, because this is, um, this is a, a, a note taking strategy that we can use to focus on the main ideas and the supporting details, um, framing out, and then a strategy. What is it? How am I going to remember it? How am I going to remember it through, um, Am I going to use mnemonics? Am I going to use a visual? And it doesn't matter if it's a stick figure. Kids don't have to be artists, but drawing out or writing something that, that sort of helps them anchor that in their memory. 
we have a problem right now. One second, sorry. Um, and so, so these this these strategies and this triple note code is good for note taking, for summarizing, for book reports, for writing, for any up writing, and for reading comprehension. Um, and if we could go to the last one, which is in math as well, with math problem solving, kids have to go from the top of the mountain to the bottom. What is my estimate? How do I match my uh, answer with the estimate? Of course, complex division involves every strategy you can think, every operation you can think of. So kids are flexing, shifting constantly. And can I have the next slide? So just to quote Ben, the student who I showed you his Venn diagram earlier when we were talking about self-monitoring. With a smart triple note to strategy, I learned to make a hierarchy of notes, have its structure around itself and relate to things. The structure helped me to study and to write long papers. I didn't stress out so much about tests anymore. So it's very, very powerful. Uh, and the self-monitoring piece is sort of, is, is key in relation to this. Um, and oh, by the way, tomorrow I'll be doing a, a professional development training uh, with a colleague from our institute from um, three to five, <laughs> focusing on the, the whole metacognitive awareness piece in greater detail. So if any of you have any interest in signing up, um, there, is a, there is a charge for it, but it's, it's um, basic, then feel free to do that. We'll tell you more details. So I think I'm done with this cognitive flexibility, Sushita. So let me ask you the final question, which is building on that, what's the role of adaptive flexibility and students' capacity to generate strategies and to repurpose them as learning needs change? So that issue of changing and flexibility. Well, thank you for that question. And uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, we are um, being very mindful of the time that we have. So I will just briefly uh, talk about a few things, uh, mainly metacognitive strategies require awareness and control. Uh, and awareness uh, that flexibility based on the self characteristics, task characteristics. What's the demand and what am I good at and not, not so good at? I need to have awareness. Then the control means the exerting, uh, exercising control. So flexibly, uh, flexibility based on the processes of strategy planning, strategy application, and repurposing strategies. So the part we don't have a lot of time here. So one thing I will say, uh, one of the things that in EXQ, what we try to do is, is kind of giving students uh, opportunities to engage with multiple strategies and uh, tailor them. So the option that student has is I already use these strategies and I plan to use these strategies. And the strategies that are planned uh, that, that the student intends to plan to use are often brought up uh, for the student to rehearse and re-expose so that it can be top of the mind. And throughout the training, we, we try to ask the student, did the strategy that you plan to use work? And how well is the strategy working? But the best part is uh, uh, during, uh, let's say the first semester, the, the 10 weeks of uh, coaching uh, in week eight, nine, and 10, the, the teacher begins to see the strategies that the student has said, I already use it. So now the teacher gives a live feedback to the student uh, saying whether those strategies he thinks he's using are effective, successful or not. The idea there again is that co connecting the self as an observer and others as an observer and bridging the gap in perception. So with that, I think I'm gonna go straight to summarizing the strategies. What have we learned so far? So in summary, I will say, remember, all the participants who you already probably know this, but without strategies, there is no success. So if we want our children to be students, we want ourselves to be students, we have to strategize. And what is a strategy after all? It's a shortcut. It's, it's an effective way of executing, or it's an alternative way of reaching the same solution with social context in mind. Second thing is strategy, a strategizing process needs to be intentionally taught. And, and this is the work since the neuroscience has been informing us uh, or has, has a strong interplay between education and neuroscience, we are learning that. And Lynn's work, for example, has shows a lot of efficacy of the, taking that approach when you intentionally teach and, and not just hope that the strategies will emerge, you're going to have the student in charge of their thinking and learning. The next thing is in the beginning, the teacher tailors the strategies for the students. It's a really important step, but it, it is the beginning step. It is not the end step. Because when a teacher develops a strategy, the strategy is created by the teacher for the teacher, 
for the student. So whose exe executive function went into it? The students. And, and so lastly, the most critical thing here to remember is that the student needs to develop and tailor strategies for themselves. So with that, I am going to say this is Lynn's website. Please feel free to visit. Uh, it's researchild.com. Uh, dot org sorry lynn also has written multiple books uh, feel free to explore that and that brings us to the end of this wonderful webinar lynn thank you so much for this collaboration and i hope our audience learned a lot i really appreciate uh the the work that you have done in our field and and thank you be, for being a wonderful collaborator thank you for having me this is wonderful <laughs> all right so we are going to end.